I'm Billy S, welcome back to the channel. Today we're ranking the mini-bosses of Sekiro Shadows Die Twice. This was quite a tough list to make, as I had to ensure I knew what counted as a mini-boss in a game where it's not always so clear, while also figuring out which mini-bosses could be grouped together and which mini-bosses needed separate entries. So here are those notes. The Shichimen Warriors, the Chained Ogres, the Lone Shadows, the Headless, the Long Arm Centipedes, the Blazing Bulls, and the Snake-Eyed Hunters are all being ranked as groups, while the Three Drunkards, the Two Seven Ashina Spears, the Two Ashina Elites, and the Various Generals are all given solo entries. As these are mini-bosses, I won't go too in-depth like I do with my boss analysis, so expect very quick entries. It's a lightning round. If my math is mathing, let's get started. All 25 Sekiro Shadows Die Twice mini-bosses ranked. Be sure to leave your thoughts down below. At the bottom of our list, we have seven Ashina Spears Shume Masaji Oniwa, the final mini-boss standing between you and the endgame. This man has the audacity to stand here with his bestie swordsman and give you the semblance of a fair fight. Sekido's combat system flourishes with one-on-one -on -one duels, and I dislike when this game tries to gank you with fights that throw the focus away from that. So I felt no shame when I grappled onto this tree they couldn't walk onto and began spamming my mortal draw ability to whittle their health down. At one point, one of them glitched onto the branch, and after knocking me down and making me respawn, just vanished. I wasn't complaining. A little bit more cheese later, and I had what I wanted. A dead seven Ashina spear, and the final prayer bead for my collection. It's a shame, because I think the seven spear enemy type has such potential in the late game to be a great fight, but pairing him with another enemy just ruins the experience. With every other mini-boss, I'm willing to go ahead and fight despite the odds. Not with Shume Masaji Oniwa, though. A worthy bottom spot. I'm biased. Next up, we have an enemy that is described as a mini-boss by the wiki and other creators, but who really just isn't. It's Lida Shigenori Yamauchi from the tutorial. He's just here to teach the players about death blows, and thus feels like a regular enemy. There's just not much to talk about, and his moveset is so generic that he doesn't have any spice to him. He's only not 25th because, as said, my hatred for the bottom boss knows no bounds. But this is probably the true weakest mini-boss in Sekiro. The man only drops pellets. Pellets! Does this count as a mini-boss? I'm not entirely certain, but once again, the wiki speaks and says it is. The Great Carp is the giant fish that inhabits the Fountainhead Palace. You'll see it destroy a bridge, then do an underwater stealth segment to avoid its wrath. The actual fight here is brief and simple, something I wish had actually been expanded upon, as you don't do enough underwater for my liking in Sekiro. But the fight truly begins when you poison the fucker at its feeding grounds with one of the truly precious baits from the Pot Nobles. A quick snack and it's bye bye great cub! You can even find the corpse lying in the Guardian 8 boss arena so you can gloat. It's an insult to get beaten by an oversized fish. I wouldn't want to be my bottom two right now. A mini-boss that is very much about the journey, not the destination, Okami leader Shizu is a queen who hangs out on the Great Sakura Tree at the far side of the Fountainhead Palace. Acting as an obstacle that keeps you from swimming in the lake until she's defeated due to her electric pelotas. It's a shame then that when you reach her, she goes down just as easily as any enemy in the area. She truly has no defense against you up close, and this shows when you decimate her health bar. The journey is the boss, but that falls more under level design than it does under her skills as a mini-boss, and we're ranking the latter, not the former, so Shizu, come on. You can do better than that. The first true mini-boss of Sekiro, General Naomori Kawarada is just past the outskirts wall gate path idol and acts as a bit of a tutorial while providing a decent challenge. You can choose to jump into his arena and fight him head-on, which will prove brutal, as you'll only have a single heal to patch you up, and your posture will be minuscule. Or you can even the odds, sneak around the side of the encampment, and get a death blow on him from above, putting you both on a single health bar. 
From that point on, it's about deflections and learning how to handle unblockable attacks. Kawarada acts as a blockade that ensures you're ready for the rest of the game, and is a perfect tutorial for what he is. He's just weakened by being the first true mini-boss because there's only so much the game can do with him to keep you interested. Let me start this off by saying, on their own, I think the drunkard enemies are fun to fight. They're good to deflect attacks against, I like that they're one of the few enemies to utilize status ailments, and their big stature makes overcoming them feel very satisfying. The issue with Juzo the Drunkard is that in both fights he appears in in Harata Estate, he has a massive fucking entourage of fanboys that won't leave him alone, and by extension, I have to kill them every single time I want a piece of that big man. At least in his first appearance, all the enemies are weak, but on the rematch, he has a very strong lone shadow with him who becomes very problematic, as I can't seem to get in close to backstab him before they both see me and chaos reigns supreme. I can handle gank fights in the other Soulsborne games, they give you weapons that can crowd clear. Not in Sekiro. So while I like the drunkard moveset, the actual arena and accompaniments, as it were, really ruin the fight for me. At least in the first version, you have that friend to help you fight him. Speaking of the drunkard moveset, Tokujiro the Glutton resides in the hidden forest just off the beaten path within the mists. Accompanied by his besties, a group of monkeys that you can shuriken from afar, I have no idea why he's here. You think I'd be hyped to fight a drunkard on his own, but I'm honestly bothered by the lack of lore. I've looked it up on the first page of Google after typing in Tokujiro the Glutton lore, and nothing. This man isn't even a reskin of Juzuo. It's the same model, not even a different color. There wasn't even a Reddit thread for him. The laziness, especially when the Ashina Depths area has already reused the Headless, a Shichiman Warrior, the Headless Ape, and a Snake-Eyed Hunter, the positioning is just lazy. Great fight, but I'm so turned away by his placement in the game that I can't get remotely attached, so he languishes in the bottom annals of my list. Another fight that generally suffers greatly from needing to clear out surrounding enemies to actually enjoy myself, General Tenzen Yamauchi sits just behind the chained Ogre Gate in the Ashina outskirts, and acts as an upgraded general miniboss you can fight after killing all of his soldiers every single time. And most of those soldiers have a good line of sight, and good gear, and take time to kill. I don't enjoy when games waste my time, and while I understand this is teaching me to stealth my way through the area and even up the playing field against Tenzen, that's fine the first time you have to do it. If you get killed by the general and you have to clear the enemies out again and again and again, it's tedious and genuinely turns me away from wanting to fight. This could be a lesson about how you're not ready to fight some mini-bosses, go away and come back later, which is fine, but I like testing myself, and I'd rather test myself against the general who has a slightly more aggressive moveset than his earlier counterpart, than against a ton of enemies who just bore me after a while. If you'll allow me to take a few moments of your time, I'm trying to reach 10,000 subscribers by the end of 2023, and I think we can do it. Over 60% of you aren't subscribed, so let's rectify that. Parry that subscribe button for more Soulsborne content every Wednesday. Back to the video. Next up, we have General Kuranosuke Matsumoto, the mini-boss at the top of the stairs in Ashina Castle. This man is rallying his troops against us, and if we want to have a proper fight against him, we need to be strategic. This is one of the only mini-bosses where I'm okay with other enemies being there, because you can still death blow the general to get him to one health bar, and these four soldiers are all gunners, meaning they're incredibly weak, and you can use the animation for death blowing them to avoid damage from the rest of the group. It's easy to whittle them down, leaving you against Kuranosuke. He very much favors his uppercut slice that launches you into the air, but beyond that, he is just like your other generals. The only challenge is the staircase you fight him on, as it can mess with your perception on certain attacks or how you attack him. But he goes down just the same. And with that, the basic mini-bosses are all dead and gone. Rounding out my bottom 10, we have the Blazing Bull mini-bosses. I don't consider either of its variations to have enough differences to warrant separate slots, and I'd argue the Blazing Bull at the start of the game is far harder than the Sakura Bull at the Palace, so we'll primarily be focusing on the former. 
The Blazing Bull blocks your entry into Ashina Castle and can only be halted by firecrackers. The issue is it becomes desensitized and you have to use more and more firecrackers each time to successfully stun it. So when that stops working, the best strategy is just to run. Run around the bull and try to predict its movements, get a hit or two in where you can, and back off around its side so it can't slam into you. If you're running away from the bull, you're doomed, as it's faster than you and can catch you easily, so the focus is more on feeling like a matador and going ole as you dodge to its right or left before cutting it down once more. It can be tough coming from calculated strategic battles to the psychotic nature of a bull with flaming hay on its horns, and I recall this took me a while to beat on my original playthrough, but with enough practice, I got the fight down. At least with the Sakura Bull, you can death blow it to take off some of its health, but beyond that, the fights are exactly the same. They stand out, but they're not quite what I enjoy about Sekiro. And going from bulls to brutes, let's talk about the Chained Ogres. These appear twice in the game, one at the midpoint of the Ashina outskirts who blocks progression until defeated, and one in the depths of the Ashina castle following the invasion of the Ministry. Both can be death blowed from stealth, and the Ashina Castle variant is much easier as you fight it much further into the game, but that first Chained Ogre. I touched upon why I dislike that fight in my area ranking, and I'll repeat the argument here. Eavesdropping on some nearby guards, you learn the beast hates fire, so after getting the flame vent from the Hirata estate, you return ready to take your win. And in my footage, I did just that. But first time players, I'm looking out for you, and I feel for you because even with the flame vent, it takes two bursts to inflict a burn status, and the status only causes the mini boss to hesitate for a short amount of time, meaning your upgrade does help you in the fight, but by no means does it guarantee you a chance at victory. You still have to learn the ogre's moveset, and the best solution is, as I've said for the past few entries, to simply run away. If you stay close, you're liable to get WWE wrestled into the ground or caught in its ridiculous AW grab hitbox that is far too generous towards the ogre for its own good. You won't have a ton of heals at this point, and every attack does most of your HP's worth of damage, so what's a player to do except suffer? You won't feel like you've mastered this fight, you'll probably resort to a cheese method or a hit and run method like me that doesn't really feel satisfying. It works as a roadblock for the rest of the game, in the sense that if you can't beat the Chained Ogre, you will struggle with the rest of the game, but it goes so hard on the difficulty that I know a ton of people probably fought it, died to it, and then gave up on Sekiro completely, and that's a shame. At least these guys have fairly hilarious movesets when you look at them from an outsider's perspective. Wrestling moves? In my ancient Japan? It's more likely than you think. A step up from the Chained Ogres, as now we're dealing with humans at least, the Snake-Eyed Hunters are next, though this entry is more focused on Snake-Eyed Shirahagi, as Shirafuji is technically an optional encounter. Shirahagi can be found in the Ashina Depths, at the far side of the Poison Pool, surrounded by her besties who are ready to shoot you down if you even breathe funny. What's good about this fight is you can use your grapple to move through the Poison Pool without much issue, and stealth is an option. That doesn't make the fight any easier though, what with the Snake Eye's ability to shoot you at any range they feel while still doing maximum damage. And if that isn't enough, their grab attack is absolutely brutal, as my muscle memory always has me dodging backwards when I see it, before I realize that puts me right where she wants me. And once I'm blasted halfway across the map, I learned the best way to handle either of the Snake Eyes in the game is to simply run away from them. Same strategy as the Chained Ogre, run, pop off a Mortal Blade drawer if you need some quick vitality or posture damage, and pray you can survive the onslaught of bullets to get that kill. They're hard but learnable, and deflecting their bullets and strikes feels very satisfying. But I can't deny the trauma at having to learn their moveset on my first few playthroughs, and the amount of one and two shots that happened as a result of my inexperience. For first time players, these guys are brutal, and making one of them compulsory is just an evil decision. Next up, we have the Makiri counter tutorial himself, Shinobi Hunter Enshin of Mycin, guarding the Bamboo Hill leading up to the main Hirata estate. As I just said, you're expected to have unlocked the Makiri counter by the time you reach this guy, otherwise you will struggle, you will get killed, you won't get past him. 
He's flanked by a rather annoying group of enemies though, as killing one will often alert another, and then you have to go back into hiding and wait for everything to calm down before moving on to your next target, which is partly what lands Enshin lower on the list than I'd like. I just don't enjoy having to kill all the enemies to get to him, especially when on fresh playthroughs I haven't got my muscle memory back and am practically relearning his moveset from scratch. My Makiri countering skills did not clock in for work today, honey. They stayed at home with breakfast in bed while I got skewered multiple times, honey. And yet I appreciate the placement of Enshin. He keeps players who aren't good enough from progressing to the upper half of Hirata Estate, where the Makiri counter becomes a more vital part of Sekudo's battle flow, and his arena provides a good amount of stealth at the start so you can learn to death blow him if you get lucky. I've seen worse tutorials, I just wish he was the only person waiting for me on this path. What's more intimidating, a shinobi hunter who needs to be backed up by a small army, or a shinobi hunter on his own, solitary, confident in his skills? I'll let you be the judge of that. Reaching the top half of our list, we have a personal favourite miniboss of mine that I can't really justify a higher placement to, the long arm centipedes. There are two in the game, one in the Gunfort and one in Senpo Temple, and both of them feel incredibly satisfying to defeat, all because they take the deflection mechanic that Sekiro is known for and turn it up to 11, giving you long combos that you have to deflect to build up their weak posture bar, before they use a dangerous swipe attack, and if you're in the zone you can bounce on their heads to deal more posture damage before we rinse and repeat. It's a fight that will go very quickly one way or the other, as a single missed input can get you on an unblockable path to pain and suffering, and that push and pull is something I find very appealing, more so with the Gunfort Centipede than the Senpo Temple Centipede, as the Senpo variant has a ton of smaller enemies around him to protect him, which takes the fight from fun to tedious, as I can't be uber blocking the Centipede while one of its kids bites my ankles from behind. Thank god for shurikens. These fights don't reach any higher on the list though because once you know the technique, it becomes almost too simple to win, but at least it never stops being satisfying. Just missing out on the top 10, we have a set piece in the same vein as the Great Carp. It's the Great Serpent, who appears multiple times throughout the game to thwart the player. Of course, this entry will primarily focus on his appearance at the end of the Ashina outskirts, but I'd be remiss if I didn't mention his ambush in the Sunken Valley Passage that led me swimming for my life to escape the beast. Or the serpent in the Poison Valley Cave that guards the dried serpent viscera that you have to trick via puppeteering ninjutsu. But its appearance at the end of Ashina Outskirts brings it to the top of my list because despite being a cinematic set piece, as opposed to a traditional mini boss, you do get to attack it, and the tension of this snake searching for you as you creep through the reeds on your first playthrough is palpable. Hiding in the palanquin as the serpent draws closer until you strike it in the eye and run for safety, failing to complete a jump, dropping into the void and respawning at the start of the entire area while the serpent is still thrashing around in pain. What, you guys escape first try? I'm special, I do things my way, and my way involves the snake slamming its face into the exit cave before I can reach it, but I somehow get through anyway because I'm just built different. A tense game of cat and mouse turned giant snake and wolf that is deserving of a feature as one of the most memorable early game sequences in the game. And it helps that later on, you can plunging attack the son of a bitch by using the secret cave passage from Senpo Temple. I always wanted to know what was on the other side of that bridge, turns out it's just an item. <laughs> Starting off my top 10, we have the Headless Miniboss. There are five in all to be found throughout Ashina, one in a cave in the outskirts, one underwater behind Ashina Castle, one in a burial cave you can reach through the Sunken Valley, one in the Hidden Forest, and one at the depths of the Fountainhead Palace Lake. These enemies are worth fighting, as killing each one grants you a reusable stronger version of the five sugar consumable items, with the price being spirit emblems instead. More than that, they're just a unique enemy type and provide a terrifying experience for the player. The first time you encounter a headless, you will either die or jump away in fear, as they have an aura that slows your movement speed. To counter them, you need Divine Confetti, good deflecting skills, and a way to reduce the terror status effects buildup. 
Terror is an instant kill effect, and I know a lot of players don't like it, I agree to an extent, which is why I try to leave the Headless for late game, because by then I'll at least have purchased the Purple Gourd or found some pacifying agents. The Headless are honestly pretty simple fights, though in hindsight. Their moves are slow and fluid, and you have to perfectly deflect or risk damage to your terror bar. Their only dangerous moves happens when they teleport though, as they'll always reappear behind you and if you're too close to them, they'll initiate a brutal grab attack. You should always jump forwards when they teleport so they have to close the distance when they reappear. Beyond that, smacking them with divine confetti will win you the day, unless it's an underwater headless, in which case you just have to dodge their attacks by swimming and hit them when they're vulnerable. In water, they only have one health bar, not two, but the Fountainhead Palace variant combats that by having a ghost phantom headless protecting him. How very rude. The headless is such an aesthetically awesome enemy and doesn't lose that fear factor no matter how many I fight, but I can't deny there's another mini boss that works with terror that's just a little bit better. The final of our three drunkards, Shigekichi of the Red Guard, can be found where General Tenzen Yamauchi was stationed earlier in the game. He's leading an assault on Ashina Castle from the outskirts and is a stronger foe than either of the two drunkards you fought before. But first, some advice. Run past him and go grab the Stairway Idol Beyond, the one you used for the Chained Ogre near the start of the game. You see, if you go from there and clear out the enemies on the stairway via stealth, you can attract Shigekichi to follow you out to where you fought the Chained Ogre, and there'll be no enemies to bother you. This takes a large portion of the difficulty from the fight, especially as you can deathblow backstab him too, and the enemies you kill are part of the main EXP farming route for Sekiro's endgame anyway. But that doesn't make him easy. Oh no. He's in the Red Guard for a reason, because instead of poison, this man is a living flamethrower. But I take flames over poison any day, so I consider this to be an improvement. This does mean if you're careful you can lure him into blowing up explosives with his fire breath which can do posture damage, but beyond that he's a normal drunkard, albeit one with strong power and posture. He can set his sword alight to do extra burn build up, so having the red gourd is certainly recommended. Like every drunkard though, all it takes is a little mortal draw to the back to get him defeated. I do like that it always comes close between him and I though, no matter the playthrough. The sign of a worthy adversary who deserves the title of Ultimate Drunkard. Climbing up Ashina Castle, you come across a dojo. And sitting there awaiting your arrival is Ashina Elite, Jinsuke Saze. Dressed in naught but a traditional robe and wielding a blade, this man will kill you. If you've ever enjoyed that anime samurai thing where the samurai pulls his blade out, light flashes across the screen, he sheaths his blade and the target just explodes, that's this guy in a nutshell. His blade sheath glints with a slight white before his attack, which is your signal to deflect, because should you successfully fend off his attack, you do massive posture damage. This is effectively a more high stakes version of the long armed centipedes, and with a lot more danger. Because despite knowing the timing, I still screw up a good 50% of the time, and often I'm looking for luck as opposed to skill to get me through a fight with good old Jinsuke. But it only makes it all the sweeter when I get perfect deflects and feel myself enter the zone where I can handle this man and his sweeping strikes. So when you get the first death blow, you get excited, and that excitement gets capitalized on because suddenly you're flung across the room having to revive. You can't let go of concentration for a moment, not until either you or that mini boss are at the end of a blade. And when you deliver the final blow, you know you've succeeded and felt damn good doing so. Unless you played the game when it first came out, in which case there's a high chance you never even knew to deflect and just brute forced your way through it. I should know, that's what I did on my first playthrough. <laughs> never forget. At number 7 we have the Lone Shadow mini-bosses found throughout the game. The Long Swordsman in the starting well of the Ashina Reservoir, Lone Shadow Vile Hand who takes the place of our previous entry in the Ashina Castle Dojo, as well as Lone Shadow Masanaga who can be fought twice, once in Ashina Castle near the entrance to the Sunken Valley, and once in the Harata Estate. 
Of course, the Lone Shadows are just versions of regular late game enemies with two health bars, but that also makes them incredibly fun to fight for the most part. The Long Swordsman in your starting well can be death blowed from above, and his moveset is incredibly frenetic and fast paced for that point in the game, keeping you on your toes as you wait to see if he throws out that foot thrust you can Makiri counter. I love fighting him early game because you feel just qualified enough to beat him, but not enough to do it comfortably. The Lone Shadow Vile Hand is also fine to an extent. There's another Lone Shadow in the room, but you can, from the Dojo Idol, death blow the second enemy to make it a 1v1. Lone Shadow Masanaga fights with the same moveset as the Vile Hand, both wielding poison based special attacks that you have to dodge lest you start losing health, but I really enjoy deflecting these attacks. Masanaga does have an issue in both of his fights, though, that he enjoys his pet wolves, but his Ashina Castle variant allows you to shuriken the doggos before you even start the fight, which makes things easier. In his Hidata Estate variant, you can actually keep up the pressure, or he'll use a whistle to summon doggos to his side. This can be quite annoying if you don't have the spirit emblems to shuriken them, but I understand they needed to change up his fight somehow, and the fight starts an optional area that's designed to be incredibly hard so I can forgive it. The Lone Shadows, whether they're mini-bosses or regular enemies, just stand out, both with their cool designs, their unique movesets, and their difficulty, and certainly deserve a spot high on this list. High atop the wooden bridge in Senpo Temple lies a rather unfamiliar sight, for as you step onto the bridge, you're met with a man, the Armored Warrior, wielding a large medieval sword, and it's almost like stepping into Dark Souls for a moment, as this figure who is so out of place begins swiping his sword at you, which you deflect deftly. You try to get some damage in, but his armor is unbreakable, and no matter what you do, you can't harm his vitality. He swings at you, and the side of the bridge breaks, giving you an idea. So you attack back, baiting him into swings that you try to deflect. He hits hard, and you back off, chugging your healing gourd before leaping back into the fray. He's close to faltering, and you back him towards the edge as his posture shatters, and you slam into him, kicking off of his chest, and causing a stumble. A stumble that turns fatal. Rama. The Armored Warrior is such a unique mini-boss that takes everything you know about damaging vitality to do posture damage, and throws it on its head, all with the subtlety of a brick due to his design as a western knight. And yet his lore is pretty tragic, as Robert, his sick son, is one of the children kidnapped and assumedly killed by the Senpo monks. And here he is protecting the monks, believing they're caring for his child. It's dark, and sucks that you have to slay him but at least he gets to be with his child. Starting our top five, we have a rematch of sorts with another Ashina elite. But this time, it's a man called Ujinare Mizuo, who has been brought to the brink of either madness or bloodlust by the invasion of his clan. His eyes burn red, and he takes up the sword of Ishin before turning to us crazed. His moveset is identical to that of Jinsuke Saze, but his damage output is far superior. He can one-shot players who haven't been collecting prayer beads, and he can two-shot the rest. He also feels a bit faster than Jinsuke, but that might just be me projecting my lack of calmness during the fight onto him and imagining things. One thing I do know though is that he will often mix up his Ashina quick draw attack with others to catch the player off guard, whereas Jinsuke would most often use the quick draw which made him easier to deflect. I found myself struggling heavily against Ujinari, and I know that's a universal experience. Utilizing the Loaded Umbrella can help against his attacks, as can the Flame Vent, as due to his red eyes, he's weak to fire. A little bit of oil goes a long, long way, lighting him up in a fire, yay! That was dumb. That was so stupid. Why did I write that? He ranks above the previous few bosses because he feels like a true endgame extra mini-boss, and the satisfaction of overcoming one of the toughest enemies in the game is just unrivaled in Sekiro. A whole 20 positions ahead of his comrade, Seven Ashina Spears, Shikibu Toshikatsu Yamauchi, stands atop a pile of metaphorical corpses as one of the toughest mini-bosses back when the game first released. I remember attempting this guy and fleeing the scene after he handed me my ass with his spear. And that's because when you Makiri counter him, 
he counters back with another attack, and I don't believe any other enemy or even boss would dare take that action. It shows the power of a Seven Spears user that he's even trained himself against the counter designed to defeat him. You can backstab him by utilizing your secret passage at the start of the game into Kudo's tower, and then sneaking down behind him to take off that health bar. And I was expecting a much tougher fight, but this time around, I beat him first try. That isn't to say it was easy, far from it, but I found that I vibed more with his moveset and got more into the rhythm of the dance in this most recent playthrough, and I felt a real sense of satisfaction, like I'd overcome a burden that had held me down for a long time. He's a newbie crusher for sure, but for us veterans, he provides a nice challenge for the mid-game. It's just a shame his bestie decided to come at me in the end game with another friend, because otherwise both the Seven Spears could have taken this spot. Starting off our podium today, we have the other terror-based enemy in Sekiro, the Shichimen Warrior. There are three of these mini-bosses to find in the world, one in the abandoned dungeon, one in the Ashina Depths after defeating the Headless Ape and his bride, and one in a random river in the Fountainhead Palace. My favorite fight goes to the initial abandoned dungeon encounter, as it's the only warrior who seems designed for the arena you fight him in. The way you can just walk past the creature as it chants its dark necromancy, wondering what it is. Maybe I should approach? That would result in getting terrored, though. You need to have Divine Confetti to do relevant damage, but that's honestly it. Unlike the Headless, you have all of your movement when dealing with the Shichimen Warriors, so you can generally avoid the terror orbs and skulls it launches in your direction. The danger really comes from getting too greedy and letting yourself tank terror orbs to get more hits off. That's what killed me most of the time, but I was playing with the knowledge that I had resurrections to spare. If they deflect an attack of yours though, it means they're about to teleport to the opposite side of the arena, and it's very important to see where they end up because it will be followed by a gigantic beam attack that will hit you if you're not running. This teleport mechanic is a good way to reset the fight, but also shows how dumb they were to put one in the Fountainhead Palace when it only has one spot to teleport to in its Riverside Arena. I've always been interested in darker topics, and the Shichimen Warriors feel like they're hiding some very dark lore underneath their exteriors, and I'm incredibly curious to learn more about them. They feel like such a unique enemy type, and I don't even mind refighting them more often than not. They look like if Pinwheel was in ancient Japan. <laughs> When I made this list, I was certain of one thing. Orin of the Water was going to be on the podium, and the silver medal is certainly fitting. An apparition that halts travelers in Mibu Village, she looks for her Lord Sakuza and plays the Shamisen to attract men to her clearing. And yet when you make her angry, she becomes spectral and dangerous. She has a backstab cheese method, but I always choose not to use it because I think her fight is extremely fun and a great practice for deflections. Orin can phase in and out of reality, becoming corporal when she attacks and for brief moments after, before phasing out and becoming impossible to hit. So while you can do damage to her, your true goal is to posture break her by deflecting her odd combos. With the way she glides through the air that is so much easier said than done, requiring a lot of patience while also watching out for her dangerous unblockable attacks, I feel like she gets more aggressive when her second phase hits as well, so it becomes a real dance against the Shamisen Ghost as you enter whatever flow state you need to win the battle. I find her incredibly satisfying to fight, and her combos are just staggered enough that I can't deflect every attack perfectly. She's just a unique character with a unique fighting style that reminds me ever so slightly of Emma the Gentle Blade, and that's a very good sign. But she's not my number one mini boss, because. Deep in the heart of the hidden woods, guarding the entrance to Mibu Village, lies the destroyer of worlds, one who is a clear mega fan of Silent Hill if the fog is anything to go by able to create apparitions to stop any from getting in close, and with musical talent to boot. I am of course talking about the hardest mini-boss, dare I say the hardest boss full stop in Sekiro, nay, Soulsborne itself. I am talking about the vindictive creature known as the Mist Noble. Don't be fooled by its calm demeanor nor its passive nature, for the horror that lurketh beneatheth have slain manyeth a foeth. 
I could have gotten a death blow from above. But my hands were shaking, I was too nervous. I was too afraid, I couldn't bring myself to do it. So I drop down. I take a swing at the noble, but it freezes me with its terror, its sheer power of destruction. It slaps me like a little bitch, and I take it because what else can I do? I can't fight back against this monstrous nightmare. Eventually, after steadying myself and my breathing, I'm able to take out his first health bar. But I can feel my power waning. I'm weakening, no. I can't lose to this creature of mist and depression. It strikes me down. I'm one hit away from falling and I say nay and deliver the final crushing blow, activating the electric fan of Gwyn as I blow away the mist from the forest clearing. I emerge victorious, but at what cost? My heart scarred forevermore by the hardest boss in Sekiro Shadows Die Twice. <laughs> oh god. I'm sorry, I had to. The joke was too good to pass up. The Miss Noble is actually number 25 on the list. It's the worst fight in the entire game. Orin of the Water is actually my true number one. I hope you enjoyed this video, including that dumb joke at the end. Sekiro just had enough mini bosses that I felt it was worth doing a ranking. Next week, I'll be tackling the main bosses. How exciting. Though I won't be tackling any inner bosses, as I just don't have the time to grind them out at the moment. I'll be explaining more in next week's video. My socials are on screen now. Feel free to follow where you feel comfortable. I recommend my Twitter. A massive shout out to my patrons over on Patreon. You guys are amazing and keep my channel alive. And let's give some compliments to the Mist Noble down below. Much love. Adios.